Hello, my lovelies. I'm Jenny O, oh, the author with no last name. And today, I'm continuing to talk about Star Stable Online and how not to make an MMO. It's important to note here that I'm not only an author, I'm a sometime peer reviewer, a development editor, a fashion designer, and a game dev who has lived in San Francisco. And for one reason or another, all of these are important, so bear with me. I want to put this first. There will be spoilers ahead for Star Stable Online and the original Starshine Legacy games. None of what is happening is the dev team's fault. Please, do not harass the dev team. None of what is happening is the ambassador's fault. They are PR volunteers and aren't paid. Please, do not harass the ambassadors. And when I say this player base of Star Stable Online are children, I mean most of the players are under the age of consent. And from where I sit on the other side of 30, they're children. Children with YouTube channels and big Instagram accounts doing great things. And still children. It's factual, not derogatory. Much of this information is alleged, unconfirmed, and yet paints a very compelling picture as most of it reinforces each other. For those of you who do not know, Star Stable Online is an online massive multiplayer game that touts itself as a continuing adventure with your friends. In Star Stable, you can ride horses, do quests, and well, that's about it. So it's decided to storm, and I'm going to go ahead and record anyway, because this is Florida, and you never know when it is and isn't going to rain. It's just what it does. So, where were we? So it's 2016-2017. We have a small game company working on an MMO that updates weekly, and the primary source of monetization is either a subscription or buying in-game horses with all the original game devs gone, an open source engine, and a new management team. Who, as far as I know, like the last team, had never run an MMO before or researched anything about MMOs and the game mechanics they should have to be considered an MMORPG, because they are not advertising this as an MMO single-player game. And the team has a very, very bad habit of promising things and never delivering. Plus, a rude, condescending customer service due to customer service being also in-game moderators in their translation team for game dialogue. Yes, I just said that. I did not stutter. With a game that now supports upwards of 16 languages that most of them outside of Swedish and English read like they ran it through Google Translate. In August of 2016, they released an app called Star Stable My Friends in order to help you manage your friends list and a newer monetization option called Stable Care, so you don't have to manually care for all your horses. You can hire Maya to do it. For almost an entire week's worth of your allowance will get you a week of Stable Care. That's... that's... I have no words. In January of 2017, they released the Star Stable Horses app, where you can raise a foal. Prep, sort of, for their Save and quests. Two years later. They decided to change their art style in 2017, and that means in 2018 they are starting over from scratch to make new monetized horses to fit the latest art style starting with the Lusitano in April. And they didn't update the starter horse until November. And then, and then, to add insult to injury, they made new skins for the starter horse that you can only buy. You want a black horse as your starter horse? The only horse you get in this game for free? Well, tough luck. It's at the horse market and you have to pay for it in premium currency. And you can't make it your starter sole horse either. But don't worry, the mechanics that made your starter horse special have mostly been stripped out. Unless you count the flying you can't control thing. There is no trade function in this game. 
so you can't trade up to a new generation of courses even if they put them out in all the same coat styles they had. They don't. And if you sell them, you get a minuscule amount of in-game currency, which is actually the opposite way of how things work in real life. Look, a trained horse is much more expensive than an untrained one. So, there were 52 weeks in a year. They tended to release 17 weeks of horses with two to three individual horses per release. 51 horses at most a year. 17 weeks of regurgitated holiday content that could have horses attached. And 17 weeks of other. Yes, that means there's a free week. And as long as they were expanding the map and putting out story quests, the players were willing to give them some leeway for being a small team working on an MMO game. They were even willing to forgive that there are now four generations of our styles of horses in this game, and that some of the horses, like the Frisians, have three different versions. Yes, again, three. This barely touches on the fact they switch from DirectX to GY or GNU or something like that, and didn't tell the players until after they did it. So they had hundreds, if not thousands, of players whose computers couldn't run the game anymore, and they weren't prepared to be able to buy new ones or get new graphics cards. I mean, it's not like their tech specs are easy to find, either. Their website is a mess, and I hear very difficult to update. They license Spirit 2.0 into the game from the DreamWorks Spirit Riding Free cartoon in early 2017. You had to buy Spirit, who didn't fit into the game art at all in any style, and there was a shop. And, um, before you could buy Spirit, Spirit, you had to grind reputation with him as he showed up all over the map, thankfully on a schedule. They paid money to put a horse in the game that had nothing to do with their game. Spirit stuck around for two years. Then they added in and updated Akal Takai with the same style of candy butterscotch coat. So if you miss Spirit and want a horse of that same obnoxious color, there you go. In March of 2018, they introduced a new special event area called Cloud Kingdom. This area is very reminiscent of Mario Kart, complete with a race on a rainbow where you collect golden horseshoes. This is the first attempt I can remember where Star Stable started to really change the target market of their game downwards. It wasn't obvious at this point with the game graphics stylization because we only had one area, Mistfall, to look at. But the game, while losing a great deal of the yellow tones, was about to become brighter, more cartoony, and very candy feeling. Then, in April of 2018, they licensed in Nickelodeon and YouTube singing star Jojo Siwa, whose target audience nine-year-olds is about three years too young for what the game was currently being marketed towards. Twelve-year-olds. There wasn't even a great deal of story with her. They made an awesome character for her in the game, put in a shop, in hairstyles, and had you collect bows to get free, mostly pink, JoJo-themed gear, including a special bow style for your horse. So if she had a message, no one heard it. Because no one really cared to go to the disco on a Friday night to listen to Jojo Siwa songs. The player base was pretty pissed about it. They saw this as a huge waste of money. And why wasn't SSO highlighting female equestrians? Who, many, also have YouTube? Fortunately, this time at least, they didn't direct their ire at Jojo herself. Like, weirdly, most of them saw Jojo as this fellow victim, almost. Like, they were sorry she'd been lured into this unwittingly. Star Stable's response was the usual, We know better than you do. And in 2012 and 2014, they had actually put Equestians into the game. Reed Kessler, a U.S. show jumping champion, 
and Tobe Larson, a famous trainer, had their likenesses put into the game with a meet so-and-so type of quests that really didn't do anything but gave the game a sense of equestrian legitimacy. Not Jojo Siwa, who doesn't even ride horses as far as I'm aware, and had never played the game before, but they wanted to highlight the disco, I guess. You can dance in the disco. It's a pre-programmed emote. You can change your camera, but you are in control of the moves. You hit a button, and it becomes a movie with music. Okay, Digital Club Hangout. <sighs> Through all of this, many, many updates come with bugs or glitches that may or may not be noticed and introduce lag into the game. It's gotten so bad, they don't even report it in the news anymore. Things are glitched and bugged until they fix them or they break the game. There are things that somehow get released early into the game and end up making entire systems like buying a horse completely fail. But remember what I said about how when you switch from a long-term strategy to a short-term strategy, it takes players a couple of years to notice? Yeah. Uh, that happened. Instead of story, Star Stable started pumping out more horses, going from about 20 to 30 horses a year to 60 to 80 horses a year. And each horse can cost up to 950 premium, and a thousand premium currency in a bundle is $30. But if you bought those 100 at a time, it'd be $55. Their biggest premium currency package is 5 thousand premium at a price of $65. If this makes premium currency values meaningless, well, welcome to predatory monetization. Because no one, and I mean no one, is going to pay the full value of $275 for that package, and they know it. Many players won't pay the 65 bucks unless they're whales and can't wait. Most players wait until the double premiums currency weekends to buy 10,000 premium at $65. Now the game, depending on region, can cost you up to $75 for a lifetime membership depending on when you buy it. That's right, there is no flat worldwide cost for this game or premium currency. They decided based on, I guess, nation's GDP and average household income how much they were going to charge for the game. If you are baffled, then you can join the player base. And remember, they started adding in things like running pets that cost up to 500 premium, and making exclusives that only come around for a week or two before disappearing, and offering exclusive things in star coin bundle packages. Exclusives they don't guarantee will come back, and there's nothing better to encourage anger in the player base than cosmetics you buy with real money and don't affect story in the least that don't return. So, valueless premium currency that can get you at most 10 horses for almost the cost of a lifetime memberships. Memberships go on sale all the time, too, when there are almost 400 horses in the game and counting. You get 100 premium currency a week as an allowance as a perk of being a subscription player, no matter your subscription level. And they'll give up to 800 premium currency out during the year. At best, you get 6,000 premium currency a year free. You can therefore buy 6 of those 400 horses, or at least 60 items of the 6,000 microtransactions in the shop with free premium currency. Great perk. Yes, I'm being sarcastic. They rely on the concept of peer pressure, impatience, and the famous cookie experiment to lure children into buying premium currency so they can keep up with their fellow players and have lots and lots of cosmetic horses to train and stand in their stable. The players, while most children from ages 7 to their late teens, are not dumb. The parents certainly aren't and have been furious about this game's prices for years. In 2016 and 2017, there was a rash of complaints about there not being any content for the main story. Many players were dropping their monthly subscriptions. 
And then Justin's rescue eased their frustrations. Complaints about lack of content popped up again in 2018, and the few main story quests we didn't know were main story quests, being they were so short and with an entire new cast of characters, really didn't soothe much of anything. And it came about, according to rumor, that Star Stable Entertainment was changing management again in the beginning of 2019, two years from when the last time they changed priorities, aka 2017, and thus from when they had major story quests plotted out. And during that year, 2019, the main story quest basically came to an end with saving Anne and the light ride. In the beginning of 2019, Star Stable advertises they have 10,000 quests. Honestly, no one knows how they are counting that number. I think I've been stuck at level 21 or 22 for at least two years now. And if they had 6,000 to 8,000 quests, I'd actually be surprised. I saw another number of 6,500 quests, which sounded closer to the truth. From 2015 to 2019, they might have doubled the amount of their quest and only advanced us four levels. But they have an ex exponential leveling system, so the amount of experience is way higher than four levels would make you think. With a new management team comes new priorities, and the plans the previous management team had for 2019-2020 were scrapped for other things. And allegedly, I can't get into LinkedIn to confirm this without signing up, and I'm just not in the mood to sign up for yet another social media platform. Allegedly, their current CMO used to work for 11 years at Electronic Arts. One of the most blatant and egregious offenders of the short-term monetary profit game models. Right up there with Activision and Gamago. And so, between 2017 and 2020, they had literally doubled the amount of courses players need to buy with real-world money they were releasing per year to a game player base made mostly of children, without a substantial story update, or even a substantial map update with hundreds of quests like Dino Valley, which was the last mass update with substantial quests released when the map actually opened instead of strung out for months afterwards. So that was in 2014, five years prior. Players noticed. All the while, removing content, such as holidays, entirely. Holidays players were subscribing for the game in hopes to take part in, and thus disappointing them when they didn't return. Or reworking holidays while removing their quests content for grind, and in general, the game became more laggy and more buggy over time with only drops and drips and drabs of actual playable content that wasn't grind. Because between 2018 and 2021, they spent two and a half years putting in at least four types of grind, including their version of crafting. Which is, by the way, just another fetch quest. It is the easiest thing to program. You must spend more time on the UI that was bugged and didn't get fixed for over a month than actually programming the quests themselves. One set of grind allowed the players to win a free horse after 120,000 reputation points at 1,200 reputation points a day once you hit a certain rep level and the horse once acquired was level one. So you had to train it from scratch with more grind. And the quest they entered to do the grind only had one new mechanic, I think, which was follow the object closely to drain it of power. Everything else had already been in the game previously one way or another, and the follow the object quests in certain areas were very clear they'd chosen a pre-programmed path and just did it to hide above ground, as these horses can run up hills and run through objects you, as a player, can't. It reeked of laziness, just for Pete's sake, 
This is a major grind update. Take the time to make sure the horses are actually not running through trees and can go in, and can only go up hills the player's horse can go up. I'm not even sure I want to call the wait for the crystal to stop being on fire to collect it a game mechanic. Technically, it is at the same time. Oh, and every time your horse hits fire, no matter what or where, you are dinged 20 seconds. Yes, these quests are all timed. You hit fire, you bounce back, your horse keeps running straight back into the fire, you get during 20 more seconds, you bounce back, so your horse runs into the fire, and you're out of time. Did you know horses don't like fire? Horses run in the opposite direction of fire? Why they keep sending a horse straight at, at fire is... I don't know. <laughs> I'd send in some feedback, but... The customer service has continued to get more and more canned and more patronizing as time has gone by and the management insists on trying to develop IP like books, music, two small outside apps where only one really could have been in the main game and the other is to make spending premium currency easier, and cartoons outside of their main draw, the actual game. We're also giving the game a mobile access point. Oh. And starting a new game? As you'd suspect, with a huge game that's not finished, this is not going down well with the many of the more vocal players. After 10 years of game development, the story has roughly, depending on how you play, 3 to 4 months of throttled daytimer story and side quests. So that's roughly 6,000 to 8,000 quests, maybe 300 hours if we're generous, so two and a half hours a day for four months, depending on where the clocks are set. And most of those are from before 2017. And I am not including the grind crest with Rahanan for the free horse. And the main story hasn't been updated in a substantial manner since early 2019. The light ride didn't take that long and was a segue to grind. Contrast with about 400 horses to buy, and 6,000 and counting in-game items to buy. A YouTuber did all the story quests up to saving Justin, so 2017 quests, in four and a half hours. So, if there are 300 hours of game, it's 295 and a half hours of fluff with grind, minus whatever story quests have been added since saving Justin. Since she hasn't added another video, I'm going to say there hasn't been another total of two hours. There is a problem here. A major problem. There, honest to God, should be more quests, or there should be no bugs, and there should absolutely be no Gen 1 graphics left in the game. There aren't more quests. Bugs are everywhere, and Gen 1 graphics are sprinkled around like cheese. Smelly cheese. The type you get at Will's Mill. What happened to Steve's cat? It's been 10 years. Where did this poor animal go? We still don't have an answer. Why? Because those quests were lifted almost verbatim from Star Stable Winter. So this brings us kind of to the present. Let's sum up again. Since 2017, they have doubled the horse monetization concept, added in hours and hours of grind instead of story, and hadn't touched the map since late 2017 in a significant way except to reskinning, and they still aren't done. They've released books, two useless apps, music, a cartoon, changed the game tech specs without telling anyone until it was done, somehow got an $18 million investment from somewhere, went from 17 million in profit to a last known 26 million in profit, went from 20 employees to 140, and oh right, are starting a new game. Their news posts on LinkedIn are full of things like multi-product organization. I'm not sure I want to touch this with a barge pole right yet, or at least go into depth. There's nothing wrong with being a multi-product organization if your gateway to your other products is actually complete. And if you hadn't been promising other products like toys and such since 2017 and haven't delivered outside of the books, which books are cheap, I'm an author, I can tell you how bad the industry is. Books in comparison to everything else are cheap. She might have got a 10 grand advance 
for three books and is being paid in royalty after she earns out her advance. Cheap. That is pennies on the dollar. And there is nothing wrong with being a multi-product organization, say if you start with toys and then make a game or a cartoon. See My Little Pony and Barbie. Because then you have a complete product line bringing you in money and is the advertising for your game before your actual game advertising budget. And money from your toys can actually help finance your game. The other way around, not quite as much. Unless you're WoW. But they didn't release toys until they were this huge phenomena with up to and including their own convention. Star Stable is not Blizzard. Not by a long shot because they went about building the game all wrong. They did finally release a new area of the map in late 2020, early 2021, that according to their LinkedIn, took their team two months to create and came out alongside their cartoon. And to be honest, it's not really that big of a map update, and it came in two parts several months apart. So maybe it took four months, if we're being super generous and saying each map part took two months, but had less than half an hour worth of quests attached to it, more grind, and half a dozen stores to buy more cosmetics that don't affect anything in the game or give you any advantage except make you look good. What? I can't make this shit up. Oh, and did I mention the Zelda warrior cats actually well-modeled textured and animated horses that talk? And not only are they NPCs, you can buy them to ride in the game, and they already had one what was supposed to be a limited time exclusive from the cartoon. The cartoon, where the character models and the backgrounds of the animation didn't match the game at all, and also they added in a limited time in the game shop where you could buy the main character's outfit. Like, it couldn't be Rania. No, it had to be the girl wearing a hoodie, jeans, and trainers. So not even that interesting. So is this cartoon a cartoon in the game world, or is this canon? Nobody knows. Now, the shit hits the fan. Okay, my lovelies, I'm going to end the video here for now. Mostly for the sake of my voice and for the sake of time. No one wants to watch, listen to me yammer for over an hour. Next time, we'll get into what has riled the fan base. So see you in the next video, my lovelies.